Welcome to Exercise 23, Survey of Kingdoms, Part 2, Plants. Like last time, we'll be ignoring Exercise 23 in the lab book, but you will need to look at pages 251 to 253 of Exercise 24, which is fruits, flowers, and used to be seeds, just fruits and flowers nowadays. There is still a handout. This handout starts with Exercise 23B, Taxonomy, Plants, No Selected Flower Parts on Figure 24.8.1. Check with your instructor, check Blackboard, make sure you've got the handout, print it out, have it handy so you can fill it out while we're going through the lab exercise. Many instructors do have a pre-lab assignment. Check with your lab instructor and see if you have one and where it is and all that sort of thing. For my class, you have a pre-lab. You still have to answer the usual questions on Blackboard to get your five points. Filling out the handout, that is the lab exercise. You should definitely study the handout, fill in the blanks and study the handout for the lab exam later. But the pre-lab, make sure you go onto Blackboard and answer your five points. For everybody else, the students, yeah, check with your instructor. I don't know exactly what everybody's doing. You will need to be able to identify flower parts on figure 24.8.1 and the definitions of said flower parts on table 24.8.1. We'll be talking about complete and incomplete, perfect and imperfect, monocots and dicots, and like last week, you'll need to be able to identify organisms, taxons, and characteristics on the handout. Figure 24.8.1 is on page 251, and you should take a good look at it and recognize some of the structures and know their functions. If the structures and functions are on this uh, video, then you do need to know them for the lab exam. If they're not on the video, then they're probably not on the lab exam. The first structure is going to be the receptacle. The receptacle is the center of the base of the flower, the end of the stem, flower parts are attached here. In the real world, we'd call this the stem. Yeah, that's the receptacle. The petal would be brightly colored or white, very broad, it serves as additional protection in the early stages, key in on attracts pollinators. That's one we often ask about. The sepal is going to be green and leaf-like. It is a modified leaf, but it is not exactly a leaf. Many sepals can't even do photosynthesis. They're also going to provide some protection for the uh, immature buds. If you think about a rosebud that's all coiled up, it's got some green, not quite leaves, it's got some green sepals around the bud, and that does protect the developing uh, rosebud. As the flower blooms, some flowers like roses will keep their sepals. Some flowers like tulips, the sepals fall off because there's no more immature bud to protect. The anther is part of the male reproductive structures. It does produce pollen. Pollen is going to be the male gamete for plants, kind of like humans have sperm, plants would have pollen. 
The filament is a thin stalk that supports the anther at the right height. Together, these two parts would be the stamen. The stamen is the anther plus the filament together, and it is the male reproductive structures. Be sure to add that it is the male reproductive structures. Here we see the female reproductive structures. The carpal is the female reproductive structure. It consists of the stigma, style, and ovary together. The stigma is the tip of the carpal, and it does produce a sticky substance that catches pollen grains. Pollen would be picked up by, say, a bumblebee on the male part of the flower. Picks up The bumblebee picks up the pollen from the anther, flies over to the next plant, and that sticky stigma does have a little bit of sticky. Here we see the uh, female reproductive structures of the plant. The carpal is all three of the female reproductive structures together, would be the stigma, style, and ovary. The stigma is the sticky landing platform that catches the pollen grains. If you have a pollinating insect like a bumblebee, he's going to fly to a uh, plant, pick up the pollen from the anther. When, it, when the bee flies to another plant, the pollen can stick to that stigma and start the process of fertilization. The style connects the stigma to the ovary. It's long and narrow and a decently solid structure in most plants. Pollen tubes from the pollen grains have to grow towards the ovules, and then the sperm cells can actually follow behind the pollen grains. The ovary is the base of the carpal, does uh, actually make the eggs or ovules. Eventually, the sperm will fertilize the eggs. Process is a little more complicated than it is in us humans, but eventually the ovary will mature to pr produce the fruit of the flower. When botanists classify flowers, they often talk about whether a flower is complete or incomplete. A complete flower has all the major parts. It's complete. It's got everything. It's got sepals. It's got petals. It's got boy parts. It's got girl parts. It's got everything. The picture on the left side there does have a complete flower. It's got all the parts. An incomplete flower is going to be missing one or more of the parts. Could be missing sepals, petals, stamen, and or carpels. The picture on the right side is missing the stamens, the boy parts, so it would be an incomplete flower. Just to be confusing, botanists also classify the plants as perfect or imperfect. A perfect plant has both the boy parts and the girl parts in the same flower. The flower on the left hand side is perfect as well as complete because it does have stamens and carpels. An incomplete flower has either the stamen or the carpal in the flower. The flower on the right side is going to be imperfect because it's got the girl reproductive structures and is missing the boy stamen reproductive structures. It is both incomplete because it's missing something and imperfect because it is specifically missing the boy parts. Here are some other examples of complete and incomplete, perfect and imperfect flowers. The flower on the upper left hand side, we did say earlier was complete. It's also perfect because it's got the stamens and the carpels. The flower, the black and white flower in the middle is going to be incomplete and imperfect. It does have the sepals, it does have the petals, it does have, that would be the girl parts, that would be the carpal. It's missing the boy parts in the stamens, so it is imperfect and incomplete. The flower on the far right in black and white does have sepals, does have petals, does have stamen, does not have carpals. Again, it's missing something, so it's incomplete. Because it's missing the girl parts, it is imperfect as well. Trick question at the bottom. There are are stamens, there are carpels, there are sepals, but no petals. Because it has the male reproductive structures and the female reproductive structures, it is perfect, but it's also incomplete. That ain't right.
I usually tell my class it's perfectly ugly because it's missing the petals, but it is perfect because it's got boy parts and girl parts. Botanists will also classify flowers based on how many seed leaves they have. A cotyledon is a seed leaf. Monocot is short for one seed leaf. Mono is one. Cot is short for cotyledon and seed leaf. Monocots have one seed leaf. They'll have parallel leaf venations. Uh, they do have one main vein running through the middle, and the secondary veins are running fairly parallel. Maybe not exactly math glass parallel, but fairly parallel through the leaf veins. Monocots will also have petals in multiples of three. Three, six, nine, twelve, etc. Monocots will have fibrous roots. There is a primary first root, but the secondary roots are generally about the same size and sometimes very hard to tell the primary root from the secondary root. It just looks like a bunch of fibers, hence the name. Examples of monocots include corn, lilies, grasses, other assorted things. Dicots would have two seed leaves. Di is two, cot is short for cotyledon or seed leaf, and dicots do have two seed leaves. They'll have branching leaf venation. While you do have one major vein running down the middle, the secondary veins will branch out from the center, kind of like your fingers branch out from your hands. Dicots will have petals in multiples of four or five. So four, five, eight, 10, 12, 15. Oh, I can't keep going on the multiples, but multiples of four or five. Dicots will have a tap root. They do have a primary root that runs down and some secondary roots, but the secondary roots are much smaller. Think a carrot. It does have a major root system going down the middle and then some teeny tiny uh, roots running off the side. Beans, cherries, roses, there's a lot of dicots out there. In this picture, which one is the dicot? The one on the right or the one on the left? The dicot is the one on the right. Do note it's got the petals and multiples of four. Oh, wait, five. It does have the branching leaf venation. It's got a major tap root, and you can definitely tell the dark brown spot is going to be the primary root, and the little white lines are the secondary roots. That leaves the flower on the left to be the monocot. It has multiples of three for the petals, note six. The parallel leaf venation isn't the greatest parallel lines I've ever seen, but you get the idea. The root system. I'm not really sure which one is the primary root because the secondary roots are just about as big. It's got a very fibrous root system. Normally in lab on page 252, we look at some fake plastic flowers. If at all possible, go to your local craft store and look at some of the fake flowers. Don't kill anything, don't steal anything, don't buy anything, don't destroy anything. But look at the fake flowers. See if you can identify the number of petals. Is it a multiple of three, four, or five? See if you can identify the sepals. Many flowers do have sepals, but a few of them have lost the sepals once the flower is present. See if you can find any floral parts missing. Does it have the stamens and boy parts? Does it have the carpels and girl parts? Was it missing sepals? Was it missing petals? See if you can classify the flower as complete or incomplete. Classify the flower as perfect or imperfect. Be sure to write the color scheme down. On page 253, there are three different flowers there. They've got a chart which lists all the flower parts that are present or absent. One trick is the uh, table does list pistils. Pistil is an old term for carpal. You should probably cross off pistil and write carpal, or at least put a slash and carpal beside pistils, so you know we're still talking about the girl parts there. If you look at flower number one, it does have sepals, it does have petals, it does have pistils or carpals, it does not have stamens. So is it complete or incomplete? 
it's incomplete because it's missing something. Is it perfect or imperfect? It's imperfect because it's missing boy parts. That's really the way we ask our questions on the lab exam. Number two, the flower below had the following floral parts present or absent. Sepals? Nope, doesn't have them. Petals? Nope, doesn't have them. Pistils or carpels? Yes, it's got girl parts. Stamens? Yes, it's got boy parts. So is the flower complete or incomplete? It's incomplete because it's missing something. Is it perfect or imperfect? Be careful. It's perfect because it does have girl parts and boy parts. I maintain that flower is probably perfectly ugly, but it is perfect because it does have the male and female parts to it. Question number three. The number of floral parts present on the flower were counted. There are nine pistils or carpels. There are nine stamens. Nine is a multiple of three. So is it a dicot or a monocot? It's a monocot. We could ask questions like that on the lab practical. Be sure to study complete and incomplete, perfect and imperfect, monocots and dicots. The rest of the slides are plant taxonomy. You'll need to be able to identify organisms, taxons, and characteristics on the handout. Be sure to have the handout handy so that you can fill in all the boxes. Like last week, remember that the characteristics go with the taxon, kingdom, phylum, ooh, class, that's in bold. We'll be looking at the specimens in lab. If you're taking this as a makeup lab, be sure to see the specimens in lab, or at least Google anything you're not familiar with. On the second page of the handout, it does start with minium. It has kingdoms and characteristics, phylums and characteristics, and eventually classes and characteristics. Minium is in kingdom plantae. Remember, plantae goes in the first little square under kingdom. The characteristics go with the term in bold, and we're still on kingdom. So the characteristics of kingdom plantae go in that first long rectangle. The characteristics are eukaryotic, photosynthetic, and sessile. If you're not up on your vocabulary words, sessile means it doesn't move. Everything we'll talk about this week is in kingdom plantae. So get ready for your ditto marks for the kingdom characteristics. You'll use those a lot. We still need a phylum for minium. Minium is in phylum bryophyta. Remember the characteristics go in with the term in bold. So the characteristics of phylum bryophyta is that they lack vascular tissue. Now plants don't have arteries and veins like us humans do, but they do have phloem and xylem, which would carry the water up from the roots to the leaves and sugar from the leaves down to the roots.
Like a podium is a small plant, it's still in Kingdom Plantae, which still has its various characteristics. Lycopodium is in phylum Lycophyta. The characteristics of phylum Lycophyta is that they're a club moss. Now it's not exactly a dance club, but it is more of a club-like structure, kind of like the Basidiomycota in the mushrooms did have a club or a handle. Again, you're not going to beat somebody up with a two-inch Lycopodium club, but it's that sort of club. There is not a class for minium or lycopodium or many of the other things that we're looking at, so it does have an N slash A for not applicable. Equisetium is in phylum Sphenophyta. The characteristics would be horse tails. Okay, I think if my horsey's tail had ever looked like that, they would have called the ASPCA on me. But if you picture a horse's tail and kind of shave it bald, it would look... Oh, don't shave your horse's tail. But yeah, it would kind of look like this wedge-shaped plant. Sphino actually refers to wedge. The equi in the equisetium, the equi part refers to horses. And to some people, it does look more like horse tails. To others, it looks more like a wedge shape. Spinophyta would be wedge shaped. Ferns are in phylum Pteridiophyta. The P is silent. Who put silent letters in these words? I don't know. But the ferns are in phylum Pteridiophyta. The characteristics is it has sporangia. If you look on the underside of the fern leaves, technically they're called fronds, if you look underneath the fronds of the ferns, a lot of times you'll see some little black or orange dots. Those are the sporangia. They're not quite seeds. We haven't gotten to actual seed plants yet, but they do have sporangia and do produce spores. They act like seeds in their reproductive structure for ferns. Cycads would be in phylum Cycadophyta. Well, at least we've got the same name again. The characteristics would be some fern-like palm plants. Sometimes people will say that cycads look like fern-like palm plants. Sometimes they say it's palm-like ferns. Actually, it's really related to neither one. Technically, cycads are actually more related to pine trees because of their naked seed in the middle. You can see the yellow naked seed on the right hand side of the picture. It does look sort of maybe like a pine cone, which does give these guys the uh, phylogeny close, more closely related to the pine cone. Pine trees are in phylum Coniferophyta. The characteristics are they have naked seeds and they're cone-bearing trees. It does include your classic pine tree, cedar trees, redwood trees, quite a bit of the trees we use for lumber.
Next, we'll be talking about some different categories of pine cones. Technically, it's not really a class, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. It's not really a class, but I did need a spot on the chart for you to write some of this stuff down. So pretend like it's a class, write it in the blank for class, but it's not really exactly a class. The staminate pine cone would be the male pine cone. Remember the stamen was the male reproductive parts? Staminate pine cone is the male pine cone. It tends to be a lot smaller than the female pine cone because it just seems to need to carry some microscopic pollen around. If you see what looks like little orange fluffy things on the branches of the pine, co pine trees, that's probably the male pine cones. They don't tend to last too long, generally a few weeks, maybe a month or two, before the pollen is mature and gets carried off by the wind and hopefully fertilizes a female pine cone. The ovate pine cone is going to be the female pine cone. Think ovary, girl parts, ovate pine cone. It does carry the egg. These pine cones do tend to be larger than the male pine cones, although they tend to be closed up and look immature. They tend to hang out on the lower branches of the tree, while the staminate pine cones are on the higher branches of the tree. That way the pollen when it falls to the ground, has a good possibility of hitting the ovate pine cone. Eventually, the male pollen can fertilize the female egg, give it one to three years, and we'll go on to the next slide and get a mature pine cone. The mature pine cone is the fertilized pine cone, does carry the seeds, tends to be a lot larger, tends to have the open scales. You can see a several different types of pine cones on the left. Uh, it does depend on the tree as to how big the pine cones are. On the picture on the right is actually the seed, the naked seed. Each of the scales does have a small seed, usually with a wing on it, so it'll flutter and hopefully fall a little further from the parent tree. Each of those scales does have a seed. Well, there's like probably 30 or 40 scales on each of these pine cones. So yeah, there's probably 30 or 40 different seeds on many pine cones. That way, hopefully one of them survives. Lilies would be in phylum Anthophyta. The characteristics are enclosed seeds and flowering plants. These would include things like roses, lilies, grasses, oak trees, beans, this, that, the other, all sorts of different things. We're concentrating on the lily because that's the one on the chart. But if you think about an apple, there are seeds on the inside of the fruit. That would be the enclosed seeds that we're talking about. A lily flower would obviously be a flower.
the lily does have a class. The class is called class monocotinelidine. Write small. Write monocot. Yeah, monocot is short for class monocotinelidine. The characteristics are the same as we talked about on the page before. It does have parallel leaf veins. The flower parts are in multiples of three. It does have a fibrous root system. It does have one cotyledon or seed leaf. See other side fits in the blank. Write small, footnote, write down the side, whatever you need to do to fit all that information in there. Here are a few other monocots. On the upper left, there's a purple heart flower with its three purple petals. On the upper right, there's a lily flower with the three, with the multiples of three, six petals. You can see the stamen with the boy parts, and then there is a single carpel that's easier to miss. On the bottom left, there's the spider or airplane plant, which really shows off the parallel leaf venation. On the bottom right, I don't know what it is, but it's clearly got three petals, so it's a monocot. A bean plant is in Kingdom Plantae with its characteristics. It's in Phylum Anthophyta with its characteristics. We've got one last set of boxes. The class is Dicotinelidine. Dicots, right small. The characteristics of the class would be the branching leaf venation, the flower parts in multiples of four or five, a taproot, the two cotyledons or seed leaves. Roses, beans, pansies, etc. would all be dicots in class dicotinelidine.
Here are a couple of uh, random die cuts. There's the rose on the upper left. There's a bean plant, very small sproutling, on the upper right hand side. If you look closely, you can see the branching leaf venation. The bottom left does have the pansy with the five flowers, and the bottom right would be a random die cut with 10 petals. That's a little weird, but it's still a multiple of five. Like last week's lab exercise, there's a surprising amount of information contained on the handout. We could ask you to identify parts of the flower and the functions of the flower. We could ask you to identify the organism, what kingdom is it in, what phylum is it in, what are the characteristics of the phylum, what class is it in, what are the characteristics of the class. There's actually a surprising amount of information in here be sure to study for the lab exam coming up soon, not next week, but soon.